most of what I'm choosing to present here is intentionally different from what you had at school. You know, probably two thirds of what I teach in terms of geometry is stuff that I've never seen before. You know, including what I'm going to show you right now. So this is um, this is the realm of stereometry, and it's kind of a hobby of mine. So we would actually, and I'm going to do in about 30 seconds what would take three days. Um, but I start out meditatively. Imagine, I have the, stu the students close their eyes and imagine what happens if you have a cube. And I'll actually have them picture, without showing them this, but imagine a cube with six yellow faces and eight red points. And then we transform it by pushing in the points. And I want them to imagine the whole process. The next day, we come back and we do the same thing in clay. Okay, now I'm not taking you through the whole meditation right now. But what happens if I push in the points here? Then I can get this. What happens if I push in these red points further and they become larger? And again, this is eighth grade stereometry, the study of three-dimensional form. It's one of my favorite lessons to teach. And then we see we get this. Can you picture it? The next stage is the hardest. What happens if the red shapes, the triangles, become larger and the yellow shrinks even more? Well, the red triangles are pushing up against each other, so they have to change shape, don't they? You see what they'll become? They'll become hexagons. So we go from here to here. And then lastly, what will we get? If we imagine these yellow, I, now it's probably easier to imagine the yellow getting smaller. And as it does, then we get this. A student of mine made this because it's, isn't it, it just uh, looks funny like that, doesn't it? It's supposed to stand up. So a student of mine made that very nice. So we have this whole, and, it's, and this is, again, geometric form and movement three-dimensionally, isn't it? And of course, they work it in clay. It's so important to work with the clay. You know? And it's, it's a wonderful process. For some students, it's hard to work with the clay. For other students, they're very talented at it. Uh, and then lastly, they'll, do, they'll make these models in paper. Um, over the course of the three weeks, they'll make six models. Um, these are the platonic solids, the most special ones. I'll show... Um, the others as well. Another platonic solid. What makes it special is all the faces are the same, aren't they? All the points are the same. They have this perfect symmetry. They're the regular three-dimensional shapes. The other two. I have all sorts of strange things in here. 120 faces. That's the most. Um, no, they would not do that in clay. That would be quite insane. But here are the five platonic solids. This is the dodecahedron. And this is the icosahedron. Could you see that these were opposites of each other? Yeah. Six faces, eight points. Yeah. Six points, eight faces. Isn't it? Um, remarkable. Who would ever guess that pentagons would work like this? But they do. Yeah. How many pentagons? I think of it as the top is sort of my, the palm of my hand, and then down from that come five fingers. Yeah, the bottom, they come up, and my hands don't come together like this. It's like this, isn't it? Yeah, do you see that? It's wonderful. The dodecahedron. It's called dodecahedron. Twelve pentagons. Remarkable. Twelve faces. 20 points, 20 faces, 12 points. These are complements of each other. They really work with this. It's wonderful. These are the, and there are only five possibilities that have this perfect symmetry that you see here. Um, quite wonderful. But there's a lot that we do with this. Um, I'll just. Ah, what's a complement of four points and four faces? Four points and four faces. So it's actually. This idea of complement, they're actually called duals. These are duals of each other. Yeah, these are duals of each other, and this is self-dual here. This is just sort of one of the other 
we, we go through all this imaginative um, exercise, if you will. Um, let me, I'll show you one more here. If I take the yellow cube and I kind of expand it, so the yellow faces kind of go out, then these other faces, the blue and the red triangles, all appear as well. It's called the small, cu the small rhombi cuboctahedron. I didn't come up with the word, really. And then, of course, the great joke is, if you take this and you cut off the points, it's called truncating. So if kids go out and they decide they're going to play in recess, they can play at recess with a truncated icosahedron, which is a soccer ball. Truncated icosahedron, yes, very good. So all sorts of fun things there. And in ninth grade, people were asking about what the descriptive geometry is, and that is this. Imagine taking this and making it more colorful, if you will. Dodecahedron, smaller version of this. And imagine rotating it and taking pictures from where you are. And this is what we do in, in ninth grade. So you actually take, and this is a drawing done very exactly by somebody not very artistic in this case. That's me. Um, and you can actually go and rotate it. And this is obviously one of the harder drawings that the students do in ninth grade on this, but it's a, a wonderful exercise as well. So, um, I would like to end with the last drawing that I have for you. And this is the complete triangle in movement. You ready? It's pretty quick. So, and this is in the realm of projective geometry. And in projective geometry, we have our triangles are a little bit different, and I'll refer to this as the complete triangle. And the complete triangle looks like this. In fact, we already saw something like this earlier in the lecture, didn't we? I'm going to look at it a little bit differently now. Now, in a Euclidean sense, in a normal sense, when I look at normal geometry, and now this is 11th grade, although I do introduce it a little bit in 10th grade, honestly. Normally, I would say that this triangle is dividing the plane, the entire plane of the chalkboard continued indefinitely. It's dividing the region of the plane into seven regions. But in projective geometry, we look at it quite differently. Sure, this is a region, <clears throat> but this region here is the second one, but you'll see in a minute that it does something quite surprising. Here's my third region and my fourth region. And you're going to be coloring yours in in a moment, just like this. I think you have some colored pencils to share. Here's what's different. We're going to imagine that this region here moves through infinity, if you will, and connects with this region here. It's all one region. Do you see that? And if you can accept somehow, without getting too disturbed, of this phrase that I threw out quite loosely that we moved through infinity. And the students are actually surprisingly OK with it. It's a certain amount of flexibility in youth, I suppose. Um, and, and indeed, how many regions do I see? Four regions. So here's the exercise. Let's put this into movement. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to fix these two points right here at the bottom. And I'm going to take this point and I'm going to move it up. Well, let's actually not think of it that way. Let's instead look at it as two propellers. I'm going to take this and I'm going to rotate it as a, like a propeller around this point 
and then take this line and rotate it at the same time like this. Do you see how that's happening with the drawing in front of you? And so you may want to start, I would say, start at 11 o'clock and you can move counterclockwise. Do you see where we're at? And so from 11 o'clock, and you can color those in, just don't get you know, too crazy careful about the shading in. And start at 11 o'clock and then move counterclockwise and you'll see very quickly something very interesting will happen. And where's the interesting stage? You see the interesting stage is where? Nine o'clock. I'd simply like to leave you with a question. Remember how I said I'd like to leave my students with a question? So I'd like to leave you with a question. And the question I'm leaving you with is, what happens here at 9 o'clock when the two sides of the triangle are vertical and parallel to each other? There's something very strange going on there. And so I'm leaving you with that as food for thought.